Advisory Council of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago from 1999 to 2007 has, and has been a regular attendee of the Economic Roundtable Luncheon at the Chicago Fed since 2007. In 2012, he was named a fellow of the George W. Bush Presidential Center in Dallas, Texas, where he worked closely with its 4% growth project. His writing appears in various magazines, newspapers, and blogs, and he is constantly appearing on news outlets like Fox, Bloomberg, CNBC, and BNN Canada TV. In 1995 and 1996, he served as chief economist uh, for the Joint uh, Economic Committee of the U.S. Congress. The Wall Street Journal ranked Mr. Westbury as the nation's number one U.S. economic forecaster in 2001, and USA Today ranked him as one of the nation's top 10 forecasters in 04. Mr. Westbury received his MBA from Northwestern University's Kellogg School, Graduate School of Management and his BA in economics from the University of Montana. McGraw-Hill published a couple of his books, The New Era of Wealth, back in 1999, and the one that really got me truly understanding the, the post-mortem of that last recession, It's Not As Bad As You Think, that was published in 2009. I believe you're going to have a lot of talking notes coming out of this next session. Get your pen ready, get your paper ready. What he's going to be sharing with us are essential items that we really need to be able to share with our clients. Uh, and again, he's going to be talking about facts. Without further ado, I give you Brian Westbury. Great to be here with you. Um, we had too much to talk about, uh, and uh, so uh, Brian's got some questions for me at the end, which I think will tease out some things that I don't cover. Um, uh, I wish I could take questions from you, uh, but I'm going to cover what I think is important. All right, so if you would have had me here a year ago, I would have told you that the Dow was going to be up about 20%, so was the S&P. For, for 2018, and for six to seven months, you, you, I was a hero, all right, until October, November, December, all right? Um, and then, the, I don't know, is this, uh, is this in and out too? Yeah. Yeah, so I don't know what's going on. Um, uh, yeah, but anyway, you would have thought I was a hero until, I, until the fourth quarter, and then all of a sudden the market goes into a nosedive. All right, and I believe that this was a correction in the market. Now, I get it, there, it was down 20% at one point in our day, and people call that a bear market, uh, but the bottom line is, is that I don't know what a bear market is. I, what I do believe a bear market is, is it happens when we have a recession, and we are not going to have a recession. So what I call what happened uh, is a correction even though it did hit down 20%. Uh, and and, and here's, the, here's the deal. Corrections are designed to scare the snot out of you. All right? <laughs> That's what they're designed to do. All right? uh, and this one certainly did. And if not you, many of your customers, right? And one of the reasons that they, get, they scare the snot out of people is because everyone has to have an excuse for the correction. All right. So Jerome Powell actually was out today. The Fed met. He had his press conference, and he gave a bunch of them: Brexit, slowdown in global growth, the government shutdown, the Fed's rate hikes, the uh, the unwinding of quantitative easing. All of these things were supposedly the reason for the correction. All right. Um, and by the way, if you think about all of these things, every single one of them, slowdown in global growth is going to affect the U.S., which is going to affect U.S. earnings, which is going to drive us into recession. Uh, uh, Brexit, if it doesn't get fixed, it's going to cause a blow up in the European trade agreements, and it's going to cause a recession. And so every one of these reasons ended up in the end of the world. Right? The Fed's tightening too much. We've had a sugar high. Now that they're taking away the sugar, it's all over for us. And, and, and this is, in my opinion, what always happens <clears throat> when we have corrections, is that everybody believes and extrapolates the, the fact that we're going down into the fact that we're going to go to zero. But corrections are designed to scare the snot out of you. And more importantly, volatility 
Because corrections are normal. We had one in 11, we had one in 15, the beginning of 2016 was awful. Corrections are normal, they've gone on forever, for our whole entire lifetimes. And corrections are the, it's the, it's the emotional price. Volatility is the emotional price investors pay to make wealth over time. That's what it is, all right? And if you don't get that, then you can't help your clients. Because, because if you think about Warren Buffett, the guy has held stocks for over 50 years. How many corrections, how many recessions, how many bear markets, how many ugly times has he been through? And yet he's one of the wealthiest people on the face of the earth. Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates have held for decades. How many bad times have their stocks had? How many bad times have the economy had? And yet they continue to build wealth over time. There is not a single hedge fund manager in this world for people who trade every day, long Turkish <coughs> bonds, <coughs> short Spanish bonds, short gold versus oil, blah, 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 all this stuff. They're not even close to the wealth of Bezos, Gates, and Buffett. Investing is the way you make wealth, all right? And this correction was a test, all right? I don't know if you failed or not, but, but I believe it was just a correction. Now, now there, I'm gonna fi go fixate on one thing that people are worried about the most, all right? And that is quantitative easing, all right? And now, quantitative tightening. So you know what we did is we did QE1, QE2, QE3, and there are a lot of people who believe that that's why the stock market is up. Now, I'm actually gonna stop here for a second and get on my soapbox. Because, because I believe, actually, if, if, if your clients believe this, or if you believe this, it is a really sad thing. Because all the Federal Reserve does is either print money or not print money. What creates wealth over time is entrepreneurship, innovation, creativity, building a business that works. All right, it's innovation that leads to profitability. And Janet Yellen and Ben Bernanke, whether you like them or not, and they're smart people, they're nice people. They do not know how to frack a well. They don't know how to write an app. They didn't crack the genome. They don't know how to build a 3D printer. They think the cloud rains on you. <laughs> they don't know how to build an iPhone. All right, so this idea that somehow quantitative easing, just on its very surface, is, a, is the reason that the market is up, is a sad thing to me, because what it makes people believe is that government controls wealth. And if you wanna know why so many socialists exist today, it's because we have conservatives and liberals, Republicans and Democrats, people on all sides who believe it's quantitative easing that drove our wealth. They believe government did it. And if government did it, we don't need the private sector. And now that we're tw tightening and quantitative tightening, they're worried about that, all right? And so let me show you the chart that everybody used. Here's, if you follow Zero Hedge, they use this chart every day for seven solid years. And look at that, QE up, stocks up, right? QE flat, stocks flat. And so what's fascinating is that what they'll say is, see, See, it's causation. And I actually always believed it was correlation. There is a difference between correlation and causation. And I think you can see it right here. The Fed tapered, remember? Everybody freaked out, we had the taper tantrum. Then the Fed started quantitative tightening. <laughs> and, and we've now bounced back, by the way, here. We've, we're now out of correction territory. And the stock market is up. So what does this tell you? Did quantitative tightening cause the market to go down? No. Did quantitative easing cause the market to go up? In my opinion, absolutely not. You want to see another correlation? I don't know how many hockey fans we have in here. But here yeah. we go. QE1, <laughs> Stanley Cup 1 for the Blackhawks. All right? QE2, Stanley Cup 2 for the Blackhawks. QE3, Stanley Cup 3 for the Blackhawks. Now they're tightening and we are, we stink. All right? The Blackhawks, we need 
QE4, all right? Now, now, is this correlation or is this causation? Because, by the way, this is just as tight of a, a, a correlation as, as this one back here, all right? There's no title, right? And I don't buy the fact that QE caused Stanley Cups to come to Chicago, and I don't buy QE caused the stock market to go up either. And the reason is really simple. When the Federal Reserve buys bonds, we're going to do a 42-second money and banking class. Go back to your econ days. Remember, what the Federal Reserve does is they buy bonds and they print money to buy those bonds. They give that cash to the banks and forever and ever and ever, from 1913 all the way up through 2008, every time the Federal Reserve would buy bonds and print money, the banks would take that money and they would lend it out and multiply it. By the way, actually, I want to stop here for just a second. See that little blip right there? You know what that was? Look at the timing on the chart. It was Y2K. The Federal Reserve filled every ATM. They put money in all the bank vaults. You know, and by the way, I got to tell you, I never bought into this Y2K stuff. I'm like, this is ridiculous, all right? I had zero cash. All my friends, my wife, they were like, what do you mean, you have no, aren't you going to the ATM? Like, you gotta go to the ATM. And, and I didn't, I had no cash. And then at 11.59, I got on an elevator. It stopped on the floor. I wanted to stop on. I got up. I said, "See, everything's fine. I'll go to the cash station tomorrow." All right. Um, but the bottom line is, is that if if QE would have worked, then M two would have gone up with QE, and we would have had inflation. Remember all those, remember, I mean, gold commercials paid for radio and TV for, uh, for a decade almost. Remember Glenn Beck? He would come on the stage, he'd have a wheelbarrow. He'd be like, the Federal Reserve is printing all his money. It's like combined market public after World War II. We had hyperinflation. You need a wheelbarrow full of money to buy a loaf of bread. Like, he would weep. Like, literally weep. And then he would get you to weep. And then right when he sucked you in, they would cut to a gold commercial. Right? And, just, and, and it never happened. Gold never went to 5000 And Gold went to 1800 and now it's back to 1300 Why did we not have hyperinflation? And the reason is, is that banks took this money that the Federal Reserve created and they put it in this big triangle and this triangle is called excess reserves. It's money that never made it into the economy. That's why I can tell you QE didn't work because the money the Fed printed, 10% of it ended up in the economy, 90% of it ended up as excess reserves. Now what's fascinating is Europe and Japan have done QE as well. And they also have a problem with excess reserves. They, they, and, and, and you know, if you go back over the Obama Bernanke years, we only grew 2%. That was, our, that was the fastest we grew. Europe and Japan grew slower. So they were looking at this, we're printing trillions of dollars. How come we're not growing faster? How come the US is growing faster? You know why it is? It's because banks are sitting on excess reserves. They're not lending their money out. You know what we're gonna do? We're gonna punish them for holding excess reserves. So what? you know what they have in Europe now? They have negative interest rates. They also have these in Japan. In other words, if you're a bank and you put 100 euro in the ECB, at the end of the year, you get 99. 0.6 back, right? Because the interest rate is minus 0.4%. What they're trying to do is force banks to lend, which tells me QE didn't work. Because if QE didn't, if QE had worked, you wouldn't need negative interest rates. Just flooding the system with money should have worked. But what really what banks are saying is we don't have the need for all this money. I mean, why? I'd rather get 99.6 back than 60. Why, am I, why are you gonna try and force me to make a bad loan? There's no good loans to make. But here's another way to look at it. Let's look at it this way. Let's compare us to Canada. All right, so here's the Federal Reserve's quantitative easing. All right, they, this is relative to GDP. This is central bank assets to GDP. We went from 5% to 23%. The, big, the biggest the Fed has ever been. We have never done anything like this in the history of the United States. Well, guess what? Canada did not do QE. None, zero, nada. 
Now, by the way, they had a nasty recession in 08 and 09, just like we did. All right, but they didn't do QE. Now think about what QE is supposed to do. It's supposed to drive up growth, supposed to drive up inflation, it's supposed to drive down long-term interest rates, right? So when the Federal Reserve is buying the government bonds and the mortgages, it's supposed to drive them down. So let's take a look. Here's interest rates in Canada, the blue line. Here's interest rates in the US, the orange line. Interest rates in Canada and the US have been no different during quantitative easing. In fact, you could argue interest rates in Canada have been lower. Not only that, um, growth in Canada, that's this blue line, GDP, has, was faster than the US during QE. We did QE, they didn't, they grew faster than we did. It wasn't until just recently that we caught up and it's because we cut taxes and we cut regulation and we're gonna talk about that more in a minute. Quantitative easing didn't work in the US, it didn't work in Europe, it didn't work in Japan, and it wasn't needed in Canada. I don't know what else evidence I can give you. Stop worrying about quantitative easing and quantitative tightening, because it's, it, is, it is useless to think about, because it didn't boost the market, and it's not bringing the market down, all right? I can't say it hard enough. Right? I, I, in fact, it just drives me crazy that this is all we ever talk about. All right? Because what it does is it avoids talking about this. This is third quarter corporate profits. We're now getting fourth quarter corporate profits. They got blowout numbers today. We're gonna have 10% um, pre-tax profit growth for this year. We're gonna have 10% pre-tax profit growth for next year, and corporate profits are hitting all-time record highs, and that's why stocks are up. Stocks rise when profits go up. That's what causes stocks to go up. Now, there are some people out there, Schiller among them, who say, oh, no, no, we're like 99, we're a bubble. But take a look at this. You remember that, dot-com boom. This is the S&P, the NASDAQ was like straight up, all right? But look at profits. They were going down. That's unsustainable. You can't have stocks going up and profits going down for long because you end up in a bear market, okay? Today, we have profits going up and stocks going up, and that's what's driving our market higher. And my belief is that corporate profits are gonna to continue to rise, and I'm gonna talk about why here in a minute. One of the reasons is this. This is software investment. The last slide. From, from your marketing guru, all right, was about your, your, your technology, all right? Software investment is going up all over the economy. This is as a share of GDP, and this is structures, the brick and mortar as a share of GDP. Now, by the way, it doesn't mean we're not building buildings. We are, all right? But we're not building as many as a share of GDP, and we're buying way more software. Who does this remind you of? Amazon, maybe? Yep. But by the way, it ought to remind you of a lot of different companies. I mean, some of you I know are old enough in this room to remember this. Remember when you had to go to United or a Delta or an American Airlines or a Pan Am? Do you remember that? Office to buy your ticket? Or you had to go to a, a travel agent? And they would give you that little wax paper and it was printed on a dot matrix printer and triplicate. And if you lost it, you were toast. Right? Forget getting on the airplane. Nowadays, I fly 300,000 miles a year. I pick my cities, I pick my seat, I pick my date, put my thumb on it, boom, I got a ticket. All right? No more offices, no more people standing behind computers with dot matrix printers. It's an app. An app. You know how much more efficient that makes United? You know why airlines are making money these days? They don't have all these people standing around selling you dot matrix printed tickets anymore, all right? You're booking your ticket yourself. You're your own travel agent, okay? And, yeah, and how much does it cost to write an app? I mean, seriously, compared to building a building and putting desks and computers and all that stuff and hiring people, how much does it cost to write an app? It's like 10 cases of Red Bull, 13 pizzas, right? you got an ad, all right? And so what's fascinating about our world today is that we are investing less because software prices keep going down. And yet I keep hearing businesses are investing. 
Businesses aren't investing. They're buying back their stock. They're, they're, they're sitting on all this cash. Well, they don't need to. You know, the iPhone you have in your pocket has 128 gigabytes of flash memory in it. Do you know how much 128 gigabytes of flash memory cost in 1991? That's the first time you could have gotten it. $45,000 per gigabyte times 128 is 12 million bucks. And you bought that phone for $299 plus a two year plan. Right? <laughs> Guess what? You got a lot of cash left over if you're a corporation. If, if you're thinking about fracking, 10 years ago it took 70 days to frack a well. Today it takes 10 days to frack a well. And guess what? The, the, the yield from the 10 day frack well today is higher than the yield from the 70 day frack well 10 years ago. So you're getting more oil and it's taking you one seventh of the time. And, I, and yet, there are economists out there who go, oh, well, that's terrible. People, companies are only investing one-seventh of what they used to. And I look at that and I go, this is awesome. All right, I want to invest one-seventh and get more yield. Don't you? Yep. All right? That's what productivity and efficiency are all about. And so what's happening is we are investing more in software where prices are going down and less in structures where prices are going up, which by the way, you learned on the first day of Econ 101, supply and demand, you buy more what costs less, less of what costs more, and this is why profit margins and profits are setting all-time record highs. Now, it doesn't matter what I say about this, because you know what? Well, what happens is, is you watch TV and here's what they're talking about. Okay, we have 4.2% real growth in the second quarter, 3.4% growth in the third quarter, and it looks like somewhere around 2 to 2.5% growth in the, th in the fourth quarter. And, and so, I don't know, have you ever watched Steve Leesman on TV? Yeah. Alright, you know, he is a journalist, okay? He's a journalist. He wasn't a math major, he wasn't, when, when you take journalism, you take, you take one class in business, it's called business journalism. Right? It's not business, it's business journalism. But somewhere along the, top, along the way, somebody taught these journalists what a second derivative was. Okay, so, so those of you who haven't taken calculus, the derivative, the first one, is the rate of change. So pick any one of those coordinates. A second derivative is the rate of change of the rate of change. Okay, so what it means is, is that we had a slowdown in the second derivative of GDP. And then what happens is that people will take this and they will extrapolate it because now that we've slowed for three quarters in a row, well then it must be gonna slow forever and then it's gonna have a recession. So therefore, three quarters of decline in GDP is a slowdown. And when you say second derivative on TV, you sound brilliant. <laughs> You know something that nobody else does. All right? Because nobody took calculus. He didn't. All right? We know what he's talking about. All right? And so I wanted to show you GDP for the past 10 years. Here's a slowdown in the second derivative. Here's a slowdown in the second derivative. Here's a slowdown. Here's a slowdown. Here's a slowdown. All of these, not one of them ended up in recession. We have grown, we're now almost at a record long economic recovery, and I don't care how many dots and tittles and ups and downs, because by the way, here's a pickup in the second derivative, here's another one, here's another one, here's another one, here's another one. So take your pick. Is the economy going to the moon, or is it going to the floor? GDP is volatile, so is employment. We had one of the blowout quarters of all time, and if you look at 10 years, the fourth quarter of last year, we had an explosion in employment, one of the best employment quarters ever in U.S. history. This is not the kind of thing you see when you have a recession coming. It doesn't happen, all right? And so, so yes, economic data is volatile. It goes up and down over time. And anybody that starts to tell you that two, three quarters, six, seven months, whatever it is, is the sign of what's to come, they don't know what they're talking about. Because what really causes the economy to change is fundamentals. And that's where I want to switch to, okay? Now, here's the deal. There are things going on underneath that are massive in scale. They are changing our economy, they are scaring a lot of people, they are changing the world economy in a big, big way. So let's talk about this one. Here's corporate tax rates in the US in 2017.
Now it says 40%. Those of you who know, you, you're going, wait a minute, I thought it was 35. That was federal. If you add state and local taxes on top of that, you get an average tax rate of 40%. And then in 2018, when we cut the federal to 21, now the average state tax rate went to 27. So let's talk about this for a second. We're at 40 and 17, Canada's at 26 and a half. Detroit, Michigan is in the US, obviously, 40% tax rate. There is a bridge. It goes to Canada. Windsor, Ontario. It's not a long bridge. Expensive, but not long, right? <laughs> and, and when you get over there, it's 26 and a half percent. And if you don't really care which side of the bridge you invest on, where are you gonna go? For 13 and a half percent? Canada, of course, all right? And so, but now when you look at, whoops, when you look at this, we're at 27, they're at 26 and a half, it's only a half a percent difference. Currencies change that much in a week. Now all of a sudden it doesn't make as much sense to go over there. Now first of all, not everybody went over there when we were at 40, people invested here. But what we say in economics is at the margin, more people are gonna stay in the US now than would have gone to Canada before. Look at, I mean, look at um, uh, uh, Germany at 30, Japan at 30.9, France at 33. What we did is we were pushing investments to all these other places. Even China, now they're a communist country. Everybody knows when you're a US company and you go invest over there, it's not easy, all right? There's all kinds of hurdles, you gotta give them all kinds of stuff, but for 15%, maybe it's worth it. But now it's only 2%. Is it worth it to invest in a communist country anymore? No, or at least not nearly as worth it as it used to be. And you better have a pretty darn good reason for investing over there. And so if you wanna understand why Europe and why China are slowing down in their economic growth today, it's because we have taken away a subsidy to push investment to other countries around the world. And by the way, what do you think this makes foreign leaders feel about President Trump? <laughs> they hate him, like a lot of people in the United States. But I believe that one of the things that we let Europe do is we let them get, with, get away with much higher taxes, higher spending, much higher regulation, much bigger bureaucracy than they could have otherwise because they benefited from our high tax rates. And we have now changed that and by being in the middle, we have now taken away a huge subsidy. All right, there's another subsidy we're taking away. It's tariffs. Now all you hear about is trade wars, but, but guess what? The US had one of the lowest tariffs in the world in 2017. Canada, Singapore is zero. I love Singapore, all right? Canada's 4-1, but they did have 290% on dairy. EU's not bad, they were 5-2, but they had 10 to 25% on automobiles and trucks. All right, here's Mexico at seven, China at nine, nine, actually they're nine, eight, and then South Korea at 13, nine. So if you look at this, these countries, and you know Mexico, China, South Korea, all of them built their economies based on exports. We all know that. How many years have we heard? China needs to get the more domestic growth, more consumer-driven growth. They have to stop counting on exports so much. But one of the reasons they were able to do that is because we, in a sense, allowed them to. All right, now, I gotta tell you, I'm a Reagan guy, all right? I, I don't like tariffs. I don't like trade wars. I think Smoot Hawley was one of the big parts of the Great Depression. And, and so, and, and if Reagan were alive today, I, I don't know if he really would say this, but he said this back in the 80s. It, you know, me and President Xi are in a rowboat together. I can't do Reagan very well. <laughs> but, but he pulls out his six gun and he shoots a hole in the bottom of the boat. What am I supposed to do? Pull out my six gun and shoot another one? Because then we're just going to get wet faster. <laughs> All right? I love Reagan, the president. Right, he made such common sense. And I will argue that back in the 80s, he was probably right. Remember, this was 35 years ago. What, what was China 35 years ago? They were impoverished. Mexico, now, there were some wealthy people there, but not as many as today. South Korea, impoverished. 
So what I believe we did is we let these countries have higher tariffs because we wanted to help those people grow and become wealthier. Well, guess what? They now are. South Korea is a wealthy country. China is approaching our GDP. They're a wealthy, much wealthier country. Now, they do have four times more people, which means their average living standards are still a fourth of ours, but they've come a long way. Billions of people have come out of poverty, and they've partly done it because we've allowed them to have higher tariffs than we have, to export to us and not import from us. And President Trump is saying, enough. Now, you may or may not agree with that, all right? But I had four brothers, all right? I will remember, never forget when my 23-year-old brother got booted out of the house. Came home at 3.45 a.m. Next day, all his junk is on the driveway. <laughs> now, for like six days, the whole family's crying, gnashing teeth, tearing clothes, it's terrible. On the seventh day, it was happy, all right? Everybody finally, even he realized, I can have anybody I want over and come over one on one, it doesn't matter, all right? It's time, when you grow up, it's time to get out of the house, all right? I want to think that's fascinating is if you watch the news, all you hear about is we're gonna have a trade war. Well, guess what? Canada's already cut tariffs on dairy. The EU has already cut tariffs on industrial goods and automobiles. Mexico has cut tariffs. China, I told you, they were 9.8 in 2017. They are now 7.5 in 2018. And since then, they've cut tariffs twice more. Have you heard this on the news? No. Nope. No. What you hear, what you hear, all you hear about is we're going to have a trade war, trade war, trade war, trade war, trade war. Well, guess what? They've already cut tariffs. How do we know? We went to the source. <laughs> oh my the Chinese State Council executive meeting on September 26th of 2018. All right, I have a son taking a little, he can probably read some of this in Mandarin. But anyway, there you go. Nine, eight, seven, five. <laughs> You know, the good news is Google has a translator. Right? Um, and, and, and I want to pull out the sentence. There it is, 9, 8, 17, 7, 5, and 18. They cut tariffs on 1,585 goods. You never heard it. It wasn't reported on the news. What was reported on the news is that China's starting to trade war, they won't capitulate, Trump is an idiot, and it's not working. And it's not true. They have cut tariffs, and they are, they are continuing to cut them. And I actually believe we're going to have a deal way before March 1st. That's why Mnuchin came out in the last couple of days and said, hey, we're close. Because they've already capitulated. So have Canada, Mexico, and Europe. Because you can't win when you fight the U.S. We are 20 four percent of world gdp when we import more from you than you export to us or than, than you import from us we can tear up more goods on you than you can tear up on us simple math this is why china and europe and everyone else is slowing because they counted on us to buy stuff and we we said it's time to get out of the house all right? And so what's fascinating about this is that the way I put it is when 24% of world GDP, which is what we are, jumps in the pool, everybody gets wet. Everybody. Okay? And, and that's why, uh, it, when, no matter what people say, these strategies are actually working. And if these countries want to have faster growth, the only way they're going to be able to do it is start freeing up their economies. And here's the last uh, change that we've seen. All right, 10 years ago, this is net oil imports. The United States imported 80% of the oil it used. Now, when net oil imports go negative, what does that mean we're doing? It means we're exporting, right? Yes. So the bottom line is, we are now exporting oil instead of importing oil. Amazing. Well, who does this hurt? Saudi Russia, Arabia, Venezuela, Mexico, Saudi Arabia. You know, the Saudi royal family is used to selling a lot of oil to the U.S. at 100 bucks a barrel, and now it's only selling less than that. Well, they still sell, we need the heavy crude, but, but they sell a lot less than that at 50 bucks a barrel. What's happened to their revenues? They've plummeted. 
Have you seen what's going on in Saudi Arabia? Have you seen what's going on in Venezuela? If you think this has nothing to do with fracking, you're wrong. It has all to do with fracking. Well, socialism doesn't help either. But the royal family needs money to buy peace. Now, I don't know how to link all the dots, but that, that awful murder of the reporter in Turkey, Khashoggi, had something to do with this. I don't know what, but it had something to do with it. Saudi Arabia has also arrested clerics. They're in prison in Saudi Arabia, and they're talking about executing them. These are clerics who they allowed to exist who actually stirred up terrorism. All right? But they allowed them to exist, and as long as they paid them off, they were able to keep kind of the U.S. safe and Saudi safe. But now Saudi royal family is terrified because they don't have the money to buy everybody off. But it's not all bad, bad, bad news like that, arresting people, killing people. The, the, one of the best pieces of news from 2018, you know what it was? Women can now drive in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Do you think one day the Saudi royal family just woke up and the scales fell off their eyes? It was like amazing things. I was blind and now I see. I treated women bad for a thousand years and now it's time to let them drive. No! They ran out of money. And so freeing up their economy is the only way to keep peace. They have a long way to go. And by the way, China has talked about cutting corporate tax rates. France has talked about cutting corporate tax rates. Germany has talked about cutting corporate tax rates. And my belief is that this pressure is actually going to force the EU to stop being vindictive against the UK because they want to leave the EU. Because it's going to hurt the EU in the long run if they're vindictive and, and keep high taxes and high regulations in Europe. All right? And so what, what I believe is we have taken away subsidies from corporate taxes, from, from uh, tariffs, and from oil, and it is changing the entire world. And just like when Ronald Reagan massively cut taxes in the 80s, I think we're going to see a shift toward more free markets around the world in the years ahead. Now, it's not as easy as it was in the 80s. All right? And there's a lot of dug-in bureaucrats. But I believe it's coming because slow growth of 1% or less in Europe isn't sustainable. They have to move, all right? Just like Saudi Arabia had to move. So let's finish up by talking about the Fed. The Fed came out today, they're at 2.5%, all right? And on the federal funds rate, is that too high? Like, serious. Like, now this chart is a little unfair because it includes Paul Volcker, you know, in the, 60s, the 70s and 80s. You know, he actually, these are quarterly rates. He actually had rates in the 20s. Like, did you know that dude was six foot nine inches tall? <laughs> and, I mean, he smoked like eight cigars a day. He's like a hero, all right? Um, in the hearing room, like on Capitol Hill, like, yes, Madam Congresswoman. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 Mr. Senator. <laughs> like, but he's six nine. Who's gonna stop him, right? And then, and then, we, and then we have Greenspan, and he's like my height five eight five nine. Bernanke, he's like five six seven. <laughs> Yellen's five three. Right? <laughs> you think rates aren't going up? I got another story for you because Powell is five ten, so rates are going up. <laughs> because the economy is going to continue to grow. And let me show you why, all right? So this is the most technical I'm gonna get, and I'm almost done. But, but the question is, what is a neutral interest rate? Because 12 people sitting around a table deciding what interest rates are, there is a way to figure out what a neutral interest rate is. And it's not how people feel, it's not how the market reacts, it's not whether we have a correction or not. It's, and I believe it's pretty simple. Now there's the Taylor rule out there, you can look it up, I'm not gonna go into it. There's all kinds of versions of the Taylor rule. I actually like to just use a really simple measure. The no nominal GDP, all right? So if you remember your econ class, nominal is real growth plus inflation. So it's top line growth. 
So you sell 2% more cars this year, Boeing sells 2% more airplanes, and they charge 1.5% more per airplane, then their revenue, their top line, their nominal growth is 3.5%. And that's exactly what we had in the Bernanke-Obama era. About 2% growth, about 1.5% inflation. Okay, so my view is that interest rates that are neutral ought to be slightly below that. You don't want to get too close. Why? Well, hey, look, 1969, they got too close. It flew too close to the sun, so to speak. The federal <laughs> funds rate went to the federal GDP. Guess what happened? We had a recession, we had a fair market, we had an inverted yield curve, 72-73. Recession, fair market, inverted yield curve. Volcker, two recessions, all right? 1991, recession. 2000, 2001, recession. 07, 08, recession. Every, sing every single time, the blue line, not, well, I shouldn't say every. This, this one right here, you might be looking at it. We had massive Reagan tax cuts in 1984. We went down to 28%. I think that offset the impact of, of the Fed going that high. But what the bottom line is, is that you can tell by looking back at history that it's when the federal funds rate gets too close to the average growth rate of the economy. Because what happens is, is then you're borrowing money, and if you're only average, you don't make any money. It drives profits down, all right? And so what's interesting is, is that today we have 3% real growth, and 2% inflation, and nominal growth is now up to five. So let's just say, because if I read uh, Jerome Powell today in his statements correctly, he's not gonna raise rates, or he doesn't want to raise rates anytime soon. But let's just say they raise them twice this year. Well, that means they get to three. Well, that's still two percentage points below five. They're not tight. And as a result, my view of this is that we're not going to have a recession. And every one of those corrections that we had, I want to show you the stock market here. This is, this is when we changed mark-to-market accounting. This is the Dow and the S&P. All these dots, I almost hate this chart because it's my forecast and I'm, I'm not bragging, but we've been bullish. I mean, I get called a permaball. I get called Mr. Sunshine. <laughs> um, but it, I've been bullish for nine years. And so, so let's take a look at this. In 11, we had a, kind of a, a correction. We kept our forecast for 12, and boom, we caught it back up. In 15, and then early 16, it was a real ugly, ugly start to the year. We, 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 we had our forecast up here, we kept it, and we made it up. This year, well now we, we bounced back more than halfway. Uh, we kind of had a straight market. We were up here. We kept our forecast. And I believe, you know, if you kind of think about it, what's, what's so magic about December 31st of any year? You know, I mean, I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to forecast to the end of the year, and I do. But, 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 but what we should be thinking is, is in terms of two or three years, not one year, not six months, not three months, maybe even four years. But, but if you look at this, for the last nine years, every two years, we've made up a new correction. And the reason is corporate profits keep going up. And so if we don't have a recession, and I don't think we will, these corporate profits are gonna continue to go up, and we are gonna make up what we kind of gave up this year. And my belief is that we're gonna hit 28,750 on the Dow by the end of the year, 3,100 on the S&P, which by the way is a gain for, for each of those of well over 20% for the year. So you're gonna have to call me Mr. Sunshine for at least the next couple of years. Thank you very much. Do you feel like Brian Westbury can see the future? This is his book that was published in 2010, correct me if I'm wrong. It says it's not as bad as you think. In, in the back, you can't read this, but this man can see the future. Listen to what it says. Why capitalism trumps fear. <laughs> I did not know he was going to run back then, but uh, sure enough. So, a couple of quick questions. Uh, help us, Brian, if you don't mind, get inside the, the mind of the pouting pundits of pessimism, as you would yeah. say. 
Uh, let's look at um, some of the, the naysayers, the Albert Edwards of Society General. He's talking about um, the small cap debt, the credit card foreclosures. Uh, you have Peter Schiff talking about, if I hear it one more time, inverted yield curve. You already right. know that. What is inside the mind when we're watching CNBC and Fox Business, where we watch, what is creating that? Are they trying to sell their, their newsletters or what is that? <laughs> well, I think it's part of that. Um, but also, everybody wants to make one great call in a row. I mean, I think Gloria Rubini made millions off of calling 08, and he's been wrong ever since. Um, and by the way, they kept him on TV for about five years, and they finally realized he wasn't going to be right again, and they got rid of him. But, but the Bears win the day. I also think that if you kind of go back to the late 90s, and some of you remember this, but it was the day trading phenomenon, and CNBC's audience was filled with day trading. They were, that's, that's what they were. So they only wanted JDSU to go up another 10 points every day, um, and, and that's all they wanted to hear. I actually went on back in 2000 and predicted a recession. So some people call me a perma bear or perma bull. That's not true. And, and I remember Mark Ames, and he passed away, he had a heart attack. But, but he argued, he's like, you must own a lot of bonds. Like he questioned my integrity. But, but that's because all of his viewers wanted to hear bullish stuff. Now all their viewers, all they want to hear is the end of the world, all right? And so, so my view is that a lot of these analysts play into this. It's the way you get headlines. It's the way you get, um, it's, it's the way you get uh, uh, famous. And, 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 you know, but, but I don't know one single person who called away, who kept it all. They've given most of it back because they keep expecting it to come back because they think it's just a sugar high. So part of it is that they truly believe it's a sugar high. Part of it is it's what the media is asking for. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, just a couple more questions. Uh, help us understand that we're, as advisors, we're constantly bombarded, as you know, I'm sure you are too, with this whole idea of, uh, let's call it the future of work. Right. Uh, yep. We uh, automation is changing everything. You you reference the the ticket counter, the the canary copies of all the tickets. Now now obviously we don't need all those workers. There's a constant fear that we that we are all experiencing. Help us understand this with automation getting rid of so many jobs, but and then we're also this huge importation of low and medium skilled workers. Right. Help us understand where this thing ends without a tremendous amount of government programs. Right. Yeah. Well, first of all, this whole idea that technology is going to steal jobs has been going on forever, right? Uh, back in the 1800s in Europe, Ned Ludd, uh, look it up on Wikipedia, read about the Luddites. Um, he believed that looming mills were going to steal all the knitting jobs, which they were, um, uh, but this was evil and terrible, so he would go and burn these things down. All right. Um, today, back in 1969, we had 70 million employees in America. Today, we have 150 million employees in America. There's been a lot of technology between 1969 and 19 uh, and, and 2019. So, so show me the job loss that we've had. And by the way, incomes on average are higher than they've ever been. Personal income is higher than it's ever been. Um, it, it is true that if you drop out of high school today, you make way, 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 way less than somebody that goes to graduate school, a lot less than you would have in, uh, back in, in uh, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, but what that tells you is to stay in school, all right? And, and so there are things you can do to protect yourself. Also, by the way, there are jobs we don't need. I mean, back in the 1800s, when we first, in the early 1900s, we first had railroad. And, and, and they had, each rail car had these two big steel rings on it, and they would close them together until they got really close, and then somebody would jam a, a, a steel post, and then they'd, they'd click it in and they'd lock it. That's the way you put railroad cars together. So if you wanted a job as a railroad car coupler, the only question they would ever ask is, let me see your hands. And if you had all your fingers, they wouldn't hire you because you weren't experienced enough. <laughs> Thank goodness we invented automatic railroad car couples, all right? Um, and, and if you think about all the, the safety records we have in manufacturing and in construction, um, and because of tools and because of software um, and, and the productivity that we've picked up, um, 
Technology actually creates jobs. It doesn't destroy jobs. Last question, and before I throw this out, um, so many of us, as you know, and we're going to just, we were so grateful that every Monday morning, the Monday morning outlook, ftportfolios.com, is a lot of people ask, where do you get all your information? Um, have you ever heard an economist speak like that? Uh, uh, plain well, yeah. English you can share with clients, and that's why we are so appreciative of you being here. So FT Portfolios, uh, with, between you and, and Bowen, and oh, it's just such an, an incredible, incredible uh, wealth of information. So last question. Uh, we're going to ask you to put on the, the, your futurist hat, Brian Westbury futurist. Uh, let's look at the genome. Billions of dollars, 10 years of sequence uh, DNA. Last year, I believe, what, uh, uh, one day and $1,000? Yeah. Um, uh, hepatitis C pretty much cured because yeah. of biotech. Um, yeah. Give us, if you don't mind, an investment theme that maybe five or 10 years out that we might want to start researching and considering. Oh, gosh. I, I mean, I believe so much in healthcare and biotech. I think technology is going to massively change those. Um, the, the, the trajectory, as you just said, you know, a, a, a billion dollars to sequence the genome. Now you can get it done. Well, you can actually buy your 23 meat kit for 59 bucks, right? And remember that? You know that lady? She's on TV. She's like scratching her head. I wonder if I'm Irish or Italian. You know? I'm like, I always yell at her when I see her on TV. I'm like, just go in the sun for a half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> if you're Irish, you'll be red. If you're Italian, you'll be brown. <laughs> Projectors. I think it's your cell phone. $12 million worth of technology, you can get it for 300 bucks. If you think about that kind of trajectory, it is going to change, in my opinion, education. Um, I, have, I, I don't know how to invest in education very much, but healthcare. So I own biotech, I own healthcare, I, I, I love it. Um, by the way, energy has so far to go. We are, we are changing from an importing nation to an exporting nation. That means MLPs, all this pipe uh, pipes and infrastructure has to be built. Um, and so I, I, I love all of that. I think also um, technology is gonna change manufacturing in, in industrials in a huge way in the years ahead. So, so I think cyclicals have been underappreciated. I think growth stocks, um, I, mean, I know they've outperformed value, but there's a reason. And it's because of this productivity and these declining prices. So, so you you nailed it, though. I love biotech, and um, and I think it's it's it has the potential massively to change. Is I don't know if you saw the announcement, but Israel believes they found a cure for cancer just the other day. Um, this, this, these these announcements are going to be coming more and more and more and more, and and with them will come massive profits, which will also come massive stock price increases. Andy. Brian, uh, we just can't thank you enough for sharing your, your anecdotes, your conventional wisdom. We're so appreciative. Let's give them a Transamerica. <laughs>